next meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Can I have a motion to certify closed session, please? I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Can I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? Sirza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. At this time, I'd like to invite Stonehouse Elementary fourth grader Laura Hicks <clears throat> up to the um, podium, please, to lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Hicks. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Here. <coughs> Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. May I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Madam Chair, I make a motion to approve the agenda as stated on the agenda. Thank you. Can I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The motion passes and the agenda is approved. That brings us to 4.01, Announcements and Superintendent's Report. Dr. Heron. Good evening, Madam Chair. The Williamsburg James City County Public <coughs> Schools Annual College and Career Fair will be held Thursday, October 26th at Warhill High School from 5 to 8 p.m. At 5 p.m. In the, in the Warhill Auditorium, there will be a Financial Aid 101 session, and then attendees will have an opportunity to speak directly with representatives of more than 100 colleges and universities, professional programs, businesses, and branches of the military. Jamestown High School's O Crew is sponsoring a relief drive for hurricane victims in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Oak Crew asks the community to support this effort through donations of bottled water, non-perishable food items, baby supplies and toys, and new clothing. The full list of needed items is available in wjccschools.org. Donations can be made directly to Jamestown High School until this Friday, and the final collection event will be at Warner Stadium on Friday, October 20th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Matoka Elementary School recently held their own event to help a school in need. Principal Andy Jacobs graciously agreed to participate in a PTA-sponsored duct tape the principal <laughs> fundraiser to aid the Huffman Falcons, a te Texas school impacted by Hurricane Harvey. Students purchased strips of duct tape from the PTA for $1 per piece and used these pieces to tape Mr. Jacobs to a wall. The wildly successful fundraiser brought in $1,530 in donations to aid the Texas school in their recovery from Hurricane Harvey. To, visit, to see the photo, visit our website at wjccschools.org. And finally, the new James Blair Middle School will open its doors to students in September 2018, and planning is well underway for the start of new traditions at James Blair including the selection of a mascot and school colors. A mascot helps the school to build its identity, pride, and sense of togetherness. Of part of, as part of the process to select a mascot, all current WJCC 5th, 6th, and 7th grade students are being asked for their input. Additionally, since we want James Blair to be a true community school, we think it's important for division staff and the community to have an opportunity to also provide input on the mascot. Please visit our website, click the button on the home page slideshow, or on the James Blair Middle School section of the site, and select your favorite of the four options. After the mascot is finalized, 
complementary colours will be selected for the school. Those are all of the announcements I have this evening, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Ms. Hummel? Um, I just wanted to tell everyone that we had a wonderful night last night with the WJCC Foundation. Uh, the committee had put on um, a very nice event at the Muscarelli, which highlighted three of our uh, winning grant recipients, everything from uh, looking at the chicken lab coats for um, Ms. Hunley's uh, class at, um, at Stonehouse to virtual reality and 3D printers at Lafayette High School. So uh, it was a great uh, event and thank all the school board members and Dr. Heron for being there along with a lot of um, our state uh, representatives and our city uh, representatives and it was just a great uh, way for the foundation to showcase all the wonderful creative innovative things that our teachers do for our children and I just want to say I wish I was in school and could have taken advantage of some of those fun things life's a lot more exciting to learn today than in the past so thank you. I'm Ms. Ombi. yes a quick update on the special education advisory committee um, I attended a meeting uh, last week on the 12th uh, they are in a holding pattern right now. They are waiting uh, guidance and feedback from staff and the school board with regard to their proposed bylaw changes. And so that information is forthcoming. They are also seeking guidance from staff and the school board on ways to see how can best advise and support our body um, so that there will be a working committee in, in supporting us in our endeavors to provide services to students with disabilities. Thank you. Anybody else? That brings us to item 5.01, board recognitions. Dr. Thank, Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a few recognitions this evening. First, we would like to recognize the Jamestown High School Eagles for winning the 2016-17 BHSL Conference 4A Wells Fargo Cup. This championship is determined using a point system on performance in state <coughs> championship events. Across 27 sports, the Eagles earned a total of 417 points in VHSL state-level competition. This prestigious accomplishment could not have been possible without the hard work and support of all Jamestown's coaching staff and teams. Principal Kathy Worley is, has come forward to accept the award on behalf of the school. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Eagle, on that exceptional accomplishment. Well done. J. Blaine Blayton Elementary and their PTA have been recognized as a 2017 through 19 National PTA School of Excellence for their commitment to building strong family school partnerships. This designation is awarded when a PTA and school have achieved a high level of family engagement or when a PTA and school have made substantive positive improvement in families' perceptions by the end of the school year. <coughs> Principal Amy Stam and PTA President Shannon Rickard, please have joined us up front to be recognized. Congratulations to the entire Bumblebee community on this outstanding accomplishment. The Virginia Schools Board Association recognizes several of our board members for their dedication, time, and hard work in improving boardmanship skills through VSBA meetings, conferences, board development and training, and active involvement in the association. Board members earn credits for VSBA Academy Awards based on their participation from July 1 to June 30th of each year. There are five levels of awards with certificates and pins for particular levels. Please join me in congratulating the following members. First of all, Ms. Cook, Award of Recognition. <clears throat> Ms. Taylor, Award of Achievement and Bronze Pin. Mrs. Hummel, Award of Honor. <laughs> Ms. 
Mr. Kelly, Award of Excellence and a Silver Pin. <laughs> Ms. Ownby, Award of Achievement, Bronze Pin. And Miss Young, Award of Achievement, Bronze Pin. <laughs> Board members, we appreciate your dedication uh, and the work that you do for our school system. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, that concludes recognitions for this evening. We will have more recognitions at the regular meeting in November. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. The next item is 5.02 School Spotlight, Spotlight Stonehouse Elementary. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. This evening, uh, Stonehouse Elementary will be presenting the, the Spotlight. And uh, as you are well aware, uh, Stonehouse Elementary was awarded the 2017 National <laughs> Blue Ribbon School Award, and we're very proud of them. And Ms. White is here to present the school this evening. Well, Dr. Heron just took my entire intro. Um, <laughs> good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. I am Melissa White, proud principal of the Stonehouse Sea Stars and official 2017 National Blue Ribbon School. Tonight, instead of highlighting just one component of our academic program at Stonehouse like we traditionally do in a spotlight, we decided instead to create a little video to kind of talk a little bit about the Blue Ribbon School application process and to highlight what makes Stonehouse so special as a whole. We hope you enjoy. Thank you. Stonehouse is one of the larger elementary schools in Williamsburg, James City County with 730 students. We have 32 classroom teachers, 24 student support specialists, and um, 13 paraprofessionals, give or take, within our building. When I first heard about the Blue Ribbon School nomination last year, I wasn't 100% sure what that meant or what it entailed. And then as we went through the application process and we realized what a true honor it was to be nominated, it was just something that we had to pursue and we know how special we are and we were excited for everyone else to see how special we are. It was about a 16 page narrative that we wrote and submitted where they asked for information regarding the history of our school our academic programs, our extracurricular programs, and we highlighted a lot of our community involvement because that's a big thing here at Stonehouse. It's um, part of what makes us unique is just the sheer number of volunteers and the events that bring in people from across the community. Recognized for being an exemplary school, we have um, really high SOL scores um, across the board, and while there are still gaps, they are diminishing gaps, um, and so that's something for us to be really proud of. Our support staff here is also phenomenal and deserve recognition because they go above and beyond to do everything they can to help the students and the teachers, and they now all work within the classrooms. We don't have any clerical assistance. Everybody's working with students all day, every day. Um, the hardest thing, I think, for any school is finding a way to Work your master schedule so that there is time for common collaboration, um, common planning time. And so, especially with special education, that was the, the year that we were recognized was the year that we had the biggest um, jump in our scores for our students with special needs. And I really think a lot of that is because there was increased time for the special education teachers to plan with the general education teachers. And that really makes a big difference. And so many of our teams started doing a real co-teaching model um, and our students reaped the benefits. There is very much a family atmosphere here and I know that that can be said about a lot of schools, but I think because the faculty was handpicked by the founding principal when the school opened, and we still have a pretty large percentage of, of teachers who are here um, from the opening. That culture um, that was established when the school opened still remains. As soon as I entered the building of Stonehouse, when they were just constructing it, everybody was a family. 
it was people from different schools. We all came together at Stonehouse and we have been friends, family members ever since the very beginning. Not only do we go the extra mile for each other to try to plan together and, and come together as a team um, within your, your team level, but then also as a, an entire faculty. And then to also go the extra mile for the students too. So after school tutoring, backpack programs, small counseling groups, all, all the things that make these kids have uh, an experience just outside of the regular school day really makes this place a special place to work as, as a faculty member and for our students too. When we think of student success, it might be something that's not even academic in nature at all, but there's always a team approach and everyone pulls together for the good of the kids. So we don't always think of SOLs when we think of student success stories. We have plenty of other measures for that within the building. This year our focus is really going to be on how do we go from being an excellent school to an exceptional school. Because we're already up here, we're kind of at the top in the cream of the crop and that's wonderful but there's a whole new sense of pressure and purpose as to how do we take the kids who are here and get them up even higher while still reaching the ones who are low and bringing them up with the rest. So it's really what can we do to continue this drive and this moving forward, which gets harder as you get higher. I think that I can honestly wholeheartedly say out of 17 years in education, the level of professionalism and the drive to always do more and do better by every single person within this building is unparalleled. Teachers also seek out additional opportunities to develop themselves in um, literacy and learning and they um, participate in Williamsburg Area Reading Council and other outside opportunities for professional development. I just have never seen the drive that I have seen here by everyone within the building to always do more and do better for our students. As you can see, Stonehouse is truly a very special place to be, um, and I would like to take just a minute to ask all of our staff members who are in attendance tonight to stand up while we applaud their hard efforts. Thing not mentioned in the video that you might should know is that we're also very competitive in nature and tonight is our Stonehouse Spirit Night and we're in competition against those Nord Roadrunners. So 90% <laughs> of our faculty are at Chick-fil-A right now trying to beat out the competition. <laughs> well, I appreciate our friends here for coming and um, we invite you to come in and to visit our school at any time and to see some of our programs. Um, mark your calendar now for November 9th for our Veterans Day program. That's a truly special one. And um, thank you very much for listening to us brag about Stonehouse for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oh, 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 oh. Do you have any questions or comments for Ms. White? Ms. White, you might want to come back up. And... Now someone's got to ask, say something, because you're back up. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that uh, when, when you first walk into Stonehouse, just the artwork on the walls mm -hmm. is just stunning. I mean, it's just amazing the, the quality of those murals from, from area to area. And I just, uh, it's always one of my favorite tours and um, the Dr. Seuss uh, Read Across America Day. So. That's a huge celebration. We it love is. that. And Dr. Hare and I were just talking the other day. She visited the school about how special the murals are. And when we're up for refurbishment, they're not allowed to touch those murals. <laughs> 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 Everything else can be touched, but not the murals. Well, and I just wanted to echo again, I said this at the work session a couple weeks ago, but kudos because it's so important to begin to address closing the cheating gap. And so what you do is so important and, and you've done it so well. Yep. Our teachers and our support staff and our specialists are, they're exceptional. Yes. Well, thank, thank you to you, you, you and your, your staff and all the students. Uh, that brings us to item 6.01, citizens' comments. Because of the number of cards that we have this evening, we're going to al allocate two minutes per speaker. Um, so, Ms. Serza, if you could please um, put the, that on the timer. Ms. Hummel, would you like to? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, like, doing my timing bit. But there's, I'm going to say something here. I'm going to give you your instructions. Um, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. 
Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Tonight, each speaker is allocated two minutes, and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. <clears throat> Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded. Thank you, Ms. Holm. Mrs. Taylor. Richard Marsh. <coughs> How y'all doing this evening? My name is Rashard Marsh, and I've been, uh, been a bus driver with WJCC schools for 11 years. I'm here on behalf of the transportation staff, everybody right here. As many of you know, we are short staff, and in turn, the drivers are covering additional runs. It's frustrating. We are tired and getting burned out. The starting pay for a bus driver is 13 10 per hour. Our drivers are leaving us because surrounding school divisions, WADA, and Colonial Williamsburg are paying more more money per hour. They also pay twice a month. We are only getting paid once a month. Some months we wait five weeks in between paychecks. We train new drivers. They turn around and leave us because we're not competitive. The parents are frustrated. Many students are late to school every day and losing out on breakfast and educational time. When we do receive raises, they are 1.5% which comes out to about 20 to 25 cents per hour. We believe that a raise in pay that we can actually see in our paychecks and being paid twice a month would be greatly approved morale and help retain new drivers. Another, what are we doing for our drivers that are maxed out? Are there any type of bonuses that we can give them? Our question are, are there funds available to give us raises this school year? We are losing drivers and we'll continue to lose drivers. <sighs> mm, I'm sorry. We are losing drivers, we will continue to lose drivers, more valuable drivers, until we can improve morale. Getting our students to school and home safely and on time should be our top priority. Thank you for your time and consideration. Mr. Marsh, thank you. Michael Willen. Good evening. I'm Michael Willen, 5015 Fenton Mill Road, Williamsburg. Um, I have two sons at Twin Middle School. When we moved here from Texas a few years ago, my boys had the joy of two new school first, snow days and a bus ride. My reason for sharing this is to support a pay raise for our unsung heroes, our bus drivers. As a lifelong educator, I know we often celebrate the accomplishments and contributions of our deserving teachers and administrators, but we often forget those who interact with our children in a supporting role. Our youngest son last year was having schoolitis, and he started complaining and telling us he didn't want to go to school. He was telling us he was being bullied and that he just didn't want to get on the bus. Enter a new bus driver, Mr. Dave. While we were trying to work on his issue with the school, we were happily surprised to find that all changed when his new driver welcomed him on the bus each morning. He started running to the bus each day to the resounding, good morning, Michael, that greeted him as he would spring up to the steps to hug Mr. Dave. Problem solved. Luckily, we're having the same kind of success with Miss Lisa, but Mr. Dave will always have a special place in our hearts. I honestly can't begin to quantify what kind of salary this kind of love for children deserves. I'll leave it up to you. Thank you, Mr. Willen. I'm going to have to ask everybody in the audience to please refrain from clapping and follow our speaker guidelines, please. Thank you. Andrew Langer. Didn't expect to be up so early. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the school board. My name is Andrew Langer. I'm a parent in the school district. Uh, I'm also one of the uh, parents founding a new organization called Williamsburg James City County Parents for Education Progress. This is an organization that is dedicated to helping uh, our students achieve their maximum potential. Uh, we are working diligently to try to get at the root causes of the problems that our students are facing in terms of finding 
uh, their, their, their achievement. Uh, to that end, it's interesting, I was going to talk about redistricting tonight, and I want to briefly touch on this. I think it became very clear, one of the things that became clear at the board meeting two weeks ago was the logistical nightmare that would ensue should the school board decide to redistrict the high schools at the present time. I think with all the school bus drivers who are coming out today uh, and talking about the, the, the gap, uh, we talk about achievement gaps all the time, but we know that there is a very ready gap between the number of bus drivers that we have today and the number of routes that are made available. If we choose to redistrict the high schools at the present time and make the accommodations that we're talking about in terms of grandfathering some measure of students, we are going to be faced with, as the consultant said two weeks ago, a major nightmare in terms of having to, having to add new routes or figuring out some way of getting these grandfathered students to school. So with that in mind, I support the drivers here who are doing a tireless, tireless job. Uh, they are, it's, it's very unsung, very thankless in many ways. They need our support. But what we shouldn't do is add a greater burden when we haven't solved the burden that we have today. It's unfair to our students. It's unfair to our drivers. It's unfair to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Langer. Judy Nesich. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, that you stop asking what are surrounding divisions pay, what is the state average, because that's not working. They all got the same problem. We're short of drivers. And the reason we're short of drivers is we do not have a livable wage. These people are the very foundation of the start of your educational process here in WJCC, and they should be valued as such. Now, we know that this year, we're not so naive and ill-informed that we don't know that this budget, the year's budget is already set, but we do know you could use some discretionary funds to compensate them at the end of each semester if you should choose to do so. In a, a few weeks, you'll or send out memos for everybody to start doing their budget process. And the first thing we're going to see along about February, when you all get those requests, is we must make cuts. Don't you dare ask these people to bear the burden of those cuts, because they they need to have a livable wage. We are asked to do the best, provide the best, be the best. In order to do that, we must recruit and retain the best. You must give them some incentive to stay here, and that is a livable wage. Our drivers and sometimes our bus attendants are being picked off by private enterprise one by one because they can make more money over there. They do not have a livable wage, and you guys know above anybody else how expensive it is to live in the Williamsburg James City County community. Our drivers and bus attendants must have a livable wage or we will lose them one by one down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Nisich. Jennifer Rodriguez. I'm Jennifer Rodriguez. Um, I know we can all agree that bus drivers are essential to the safety of our children, but I'm here to make sure you understand that they are also a part of our children's educational team. And not just helping students learn how to behave on the bus stop or in the bus. What many of you don't know is that bus drivers like Ramona Randolph take the time to work with teachers and school administration when children are having a hard time on the bus. She provided my son's school with vital information we shared with our doctor to help determine that our son had sensory processing disorder. He wasn't just a spoiled kindergartner with behavior issues. Many of these behavior problems would be lessened by reasonable accommodations, and her input helped us round out medical treatment and early educational intervention. They allowed our son to become a quirky eighth grader who's on the honor roll and who's a productive participant in the educational environment. A bus driver helped us change the course of our son's life, and any parent can take the next step to understand a bus driver helped us change our whole family's life and the lives of hundreds of children he has interacted with at school over the past eight years. Ramona and every bus driver my son has had since are an important part of his education as his, each of his teachers are. I repeat again, bus drivers are an important part of our children's educational team. We must find a way to compensate them appropriately so they are willing and proud to drive for our families and for our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Kate Lebrano. <coughs> Hi, 
Hi, I'm Kate Lebrano. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Williamsburg, James City County. I am an elementary school counselor of 11 years. And, whew, sorry, it's my first time talking in a big group of adults. Um, <laughs> and I am, most importantly, a mom of two kids. Um, I have a first grader at Laurel Lane Elementary School, and I have a three-year-old um, who does the Bright Beginnings program at J.B. Blayton. I want to say that the teachers, administrators, the bus drivers, the bus driver aides, they are incredible and amazing. I have loved watching my children thrive in this school system. My concern arose recently when my three-year-old son's bus doubled in time from 28 minutes one way to close to an hour one way. Not only is this a long time for a three-year-old to sit on a bus, it's a long time for my son. My son has a developmental delay. <sighs> Sorry. And he's quite delayed in his expressive language. His developmental delay means that he cannot express his wants, his needs, his discomfort, his joy, or frustrations in the same way that other kids his age can. Transportation sent home a letter two days before the bus change saying there would be a slight change in his transportation. Attached was a route stop list saying, which was not even realistic. For example, they have a bus, ooh, 30 seconds. They have a bus that goes from his school to the next stop in, 30 sec in 60 seconds that is a half a mile away. I've been putting kids in car seats for seven years and that's not even possible. I have spoken to the Bright Beginnings principal, to the assistant superintendent, I can't say names, um, and they have been empathetic, responsive, kind, but they have a roadblock of the transportation and logistics at the highest level. It is not his fault that y'all can't get it together, that the transportation system can't get it together. I hope that y'all can find a way to rectify this um, and to see how inappropriate it is to have a three-year-old on a bus for this time. I know I went over. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Lebrano. If you want to give your remarks to the clerk, we can. I they do. can be, yeah, they can be scanned and sent to us. Thank you. Lilla Kalik. I got that right. It's not the first time my name has been butchered. I'm sure it won't be the last. My name is Lila Kalik. Um, I'm a proud parent of two students that attend DJ Montague. Um, and I just wanted to take a chance this evening to show my support for the bus drivers, um, specifically our bus driver, because she's the one we know. I asked my kids and I asked our kids in the neighborhood um, what makes our bus driver different. Because um, I thought maybe in their own words, um, they'd be able to describe how much they mean to them. Um, my, my daughter said Miss Jo was kind and patient and cool. I gotta be honest, I don't think she'd say the same thing about me and our minivan. Um, <laughs> I can only imagine with a bus full of kids what that's like. Um, my neighbor had said, Miss Jo, I love you because you are nice, you are fun, and you care about us. Um, another neighbor of ours said Miss Jo is very kind. She is always careful and safe when she brings us to and from school. She's nice and always tries to let us sit with our friends on the bus. She is so nice, she cried on the last day of school. I can imagine those tears were genuine because she's <laughs> watching these kids grow up. <laughs> um, and also, she's probably excited to have the summer off from these kids. <laughs> um, last, it was uh, from my seven-year-old. I found this in his yearbook. It just said, Miss Jo. And I said, is that your bus driver, Miss Jo, that signed your yearbook? And he goes, yeah, Miss Jo is my friend. Um, the bus drivers are the first adult they see and the last person they see at the end of their school day. And uh, I know my kids, that's not their best time of day. Um, so I can only imagine the patience that's needed to do your job. And thank you just isn't sufficient. Um, I'm not sure what the wage issues are, but um, I urge you to do what we can. Um, because these people are important to our students. Thank you, Ms. Kalik. Kenna Williams. Hi, my name is Kenna Williams, and I'm a senior from Tab High School. Y Street is the youth volunteer program of the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth that focuses on promoting healthy living in Virginia. I'm here to talk about how Y Street's 24-7 campaign is helping Virginia schools be tobacco and e-cigarette free 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
The 24-7 campaign helps Virginia school divisions adopt, implement, and enforce 100% comprehensive tobacco and e-cigarette free policies. Under 100% comprehensive policy, tobacco and e-cigarette use, possession, and distribution is prohibited by anyone, anywhere, at any time. The James City County School Division is doing a great job committing to the health of students, staff, and visitors. In your folders are copies of cur current tobacco-free policies to use as reference. Currently, your policy language reflects what is required by the state, but we would like to partner with you to strengthen your policy to help close any loopholes and become 100% comprehensive. First, we recommend updating the definition of property in your policies. It specifies many places where tobacco is prohibited, but there are potential gray areas it may not cover. We recommend to expand the definition of property to include on or off-site for properties inside, outside, and for vehicles owned, leased, or contracted by the division. Include any school-sponsored or school-related events, whether on or off-site. Second, prohibit the use and distribution of tobacco, electronic smoking devices, and products containing nicotine by staff, contractors, and visitors, whether on or off-site. Third, extend the policy to include possession and distribution of tobacco products by students, minors, and policy KGC. Fourth, expand your definition of tobacco products and tobacco use to include electronic smoking devices and products containing nicotine. Fifth, require consequences for staff and visitors. Sixth, simplify your requirements for tobacco-free signs. Currently, it requires signs that feature cigarettes, but we recommend a more general requirement so signs can feature alternative products. Finally, expand the language to provide referrals to sensation resources for students, such as numbers for quit hotlines and web resources. The 24-7 toolkit details these resources and makes it easy to offer them as necessary. As a partner and resource to the James City County Division, we are here to help offer and update your tobacco policy so it includes all tobacco-free language. Thank you, Ms. Thank Williams. You. Would you mind uh, sharing your remarks with the clerk so they can be scanned and sent to us, please? Thank you. Stephen C. Smith. Yes. something for the board members can I give it to you or do you what clerk and okay show, yeah. greetings I'll cut right to the chase I know we got a crowded agenda here tonight um, First thing I'm going to say is I came here tonight as the chancellor of Henricus College 1619, first college in America, established in 1619 by the Virginia General Assembly, which met at Jamestown, and they indicated that the college campus would be in what's now Henrico County, from the fall line all the way down to about the I-295 bridge across the river. Um, I used to live here in Williamsburg area and worked at Jamestown Island, Colonial Williamsburg too, but in, relevant to this is I worked at Jamestown and became aware of this college. Well, who ever heard of that? Why are we talking about it? Well, I got into it, and to make this long story short, we brought it back into existence 25 years ago right now, this year. The importance uh, of it is several fold. Um, let me get right to the, you know, when you have a big idea, and you have to capture that idea and get it written down, or it'll get away from you. Well, I'm sure you agree that if you have a big idea, you should have a big way to get it written down. And that's what we got here. This is a, for, uh, did you give everyone? One? Not yet. Okay, well, we got one over here for you, everybody. Um, and it's only for big ideas, none of this routine, day-to-day -day stuff. Um, this has real pencil lead. And I might point out a big eraser on the other end. And the label on there says the 400th anniversary of Henricus College. And my name and our website. And this is our official invitation to the 400th anniversary coming up 2019. And uh, did this paper get passed out yet? OK. Uh, sorry. Well, I, we'll I don't live it. here now, so I just barely got here in time to even get to <laughs> 
And you're, so, you're out of time. <laughs> okay. I'll point out what it is, and I won't talk about it. Well, you can give it to um, Ms. Serza, and she can, she'll make okay, sure that we, well, I'm about we half get deaf, it. So. <laughs> so on the back of this, first part, the college information. The back of it is the state law that requires the Virginia Charters to be taught in all the public schools. 1995. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Smith. And we are asking this board to work with us as we prepare to answer how well is this care being carried out. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Anniversary. And I'll be back in touch with you about that. Thank you. Sometime to be on the agenda to, to talk a little bit longer than that. So Thank you, sir. Don't forget your pencils. Thank you, Thank you very you. much, sir. Melissa Trenum. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. My name is Melissa Trainum, and I'm speaking to you tonight, tonight as a reading recovery specialist at James River Elementary School, DJ Montague's PTA <coughs> president, and the proud mother of a first grader at DJ Montague Elementary School. Um, as an educator and a parent, I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of our school bus drivers in the day in the life of a child. Our school bus drivers are the first and last points of contact our children have with the school division every single day. When the school bus is 30 to 40 minutes late picking children up in the morning and 30 to 40 minutes late picking children up from school to bring them home in the afternoon, it can rock their little worlds. And when it happens on a daily basis, no longer is it a bus driver issue as much as it is a management issue. It is a, it is a demanding job where discipline problems can be numerous, pay inequitable, and <coughs> responsibility enormous. If we want to hire more bus drivers and if we want to retain more bus drivers, please, please listen to and support the bus, bus drivers we have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Trainum. Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams. Good evening, school board members, Madam Chair, and Dr. Heron. I'm Jacqueline Bridgeforth Williams, founder of the grassroots organization, The Village Initiative. Um, our organization uh, was founded to address our double digit achievement gap in our community. And I am thrilled to announce to you today as of today, we have 35 tutors with our tutoring initiative, which we have been able to accomplish with our partners at the College of William and Mary. Our tutors start training tomorrow at William and Mary, and we will be sending tutors to James River Elementary School every week. We will be sending a tutor for every classroom. We're also excited that we will be sending tutors and mentors to Berkeley Middle School as well. Um, we want to thank you all for your support. We are here to support. We will continue to support any effort that will help each child within our school system. Um, and we continue to advocate for the hiring of teachers of color. We know that when children see people that look more like them, they tend to do better in school. And studies show that all children benefit from teachers of color and from having cultural experiences from all people in our community. I want to thank the bus drivers. I'm a little, um, I didn't prepare anything tonight, but um, I want to thank you guys for what you all do and helping the children as well. And you are all always welcome to come out to the Village Initiative because we are advocating for the children and families in this community. And um, you all are welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bridgeforth Williams. Karen McKenzie. Oh, 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 did you? Um, and I also wanted to add that um, we will be doing a fundraising concert next week, next Friday at 7.30 p.m., and you are all invited. It is based on donations, and the donations will go to the Tutoring Initiative for Social Change, sponsored by the Universalist Church and the Village Initiative. And thank you all for coming to our meetings and supporting us as well. Thank you. Karen McKenzie. Good evening. I'm not really prepared because I didn't write anything, but I came in and I thought I'd speak anyway. Um, anybody that knows me knows I speak a lot, so I thought I, this is a good forum to do it in. Um, I have a daughter who's in first grade at DJ Montague. She has special needs, and 
so many people, I'm going to echo what they've already said, her day starts with her bus driver. The bus drivers that she's had, she did two years at Bright Beginnings at Layton, and now she's on her second year at DJ. That has been such a critical point in her day and in her experience in school. She went off to school at three years old, and if it had not been for her bus driver, I, I followed the bus the first two weeks, and I, ju I just, I don't, it, it changed everything. And I guess that what kind of keeps coming back to me is that, that saying of no children left behind and that whole policy that in particular Bright Beginnings has done did an amazing job and DJ has been amazing in what they've done to support her and accommodate her um, especially with her recent diagnoses and I guess I feel like it it is so critical for her to um, she has a very difficult time with transitions it's very difficult for her to start her day late and um, with what's happening with our bus drivers right now, I, it's it's very she's very anxious. I'm now having to drive her to school. That's a that's another transition and another difficulty for her to handle. And if it weren't for the bus drivers, it makes me feel horrible for them because I feel like they're getting blamed for being late, and they're they're actually taking the brunt of of everything negative that's happening. And they're actually the ones that are making such a difference and have made. Um, my daughter's life in particular so much easier transitioning both in the morning and in the afternoon. I guess that's really all I want to say, but it's just, I just want them to be supported because without them, I mean, I, I don't trust her with anybody. She's only been babysat by my parents. It, I let them go with her. I let her go with them. Thank, so thank you, Ms. Please Hanson. support them. <laughs> Michelle Brenner. <laughs> Good evening. Not prepared, but I just want to say I'm in such support for the bus drivers to get paid twice a month and um, safety, discipline, and um, we just have to treat them fairly. Each child gets to school safely, that's what we need, and get home safely. So if we can just look at that with the whole redistributing, that would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brenner. Kim Hunley. Good evening. I'm Kim Hunley, uh, president of the Williamsburg Education Association and proud teacher of Stonehouse, the Blue Ribbon Award winning. I'm also very proud of the bus drivers. I didn't know tonight that they would be here, but um, I'm just really proud. It take, I hear so much about um, from my colleagues, they're afraid to come to forward. They're afraid of retaliation and things like that. And that hasn't been my experience, but I don't want to devalue anybody's. But for them to come forward and to speak, and I know there's so many other stories that we're not hearing tonight. And they have their shirts on, and I just, I know we're not going to applaud them, but I want them to just stand, just, I think, they just need to stand for just a minute, every last bus driver, so we can look look at you. Just stand, please. Thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> now, to, but um, I know I have had um, talks with Dr. Hearn, the executive board, and we are working um, to try to help things with transportation. Also, in the midst of with um, everything that's going on, I just want people that, if you haven't gone to the website to look at our 10 points of pride, we still need to focus on those things. And I hope that next year, one of our prides will be the um, impact we have made to support the bus drivers. I, I am just, I am holding out that that is going to be one of our things that we're going to be very proud of next year. Um, I also gave the board members some um, treats tonight, um, things that, points that people don't know about uh, candy corn. But I do want to say that for the people out in the public, that if you put a teal pumpkin in your window at your house, that lets students that have allergies know that they can come to your house. So we do need to think about those children that cannot eat other treats during this season. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hundley. That was our last speaker card. Thank you for everyone who came out to speak.
Um, that brings us to the consent agenda. <coughs> sure, I'm right there. Yeah. Item 7.01, approval of minutes from the following meetings, September 19th, 2017, and October 3rd, 2017. 7.02, personnel actions. 7.03, financial report and monthly bills and payroll, September 2017. 7.04 resolution R-19-17 school psychology awareness week November 13 through 17 2017 7.05 resolution R-20-17 national school bus <coughs> safety week and school bus transportation employees appreciation day 7.06 revised policy IGBG homebound instruction 7.07 .07, revised policy JHCC slash GBEC communicable diseases, and 7.08 revised policy JHH student welfare and suicide. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I, I move to approval of the consent agenda so ably read by yourself and presented this evening. Thank you, sir. A second, please. Second. Any discussion? All right, with that, it's been moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? His own be. Aye. Ms. Taylor. Aye. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. That the motion passes. All right, that brings us up to item 8.01, middle school redistricting criteria. Um, just a reminder, we are um, ad addressing both middle school and high school separately from, from this um, from uh, this point forward and tonight we are taking action on criteria and criteria only and um, I apologize for some of you for whom this is a repeat but because um, there's been a little bit of confusion in the way um, some things have been represented uh, in out in the public um, I thought I would just uh, clarify for moving forward for tonight's uh, meeting so at the first school board and provide background for the listening public at the first school board meeting in September we discussed the various aspects of redistricting including disruption feeder patterns proximity capacity neighborhoods and socioeconomic balance um, our discussion was informed by staff the consultant our own experiences with redistricting our knowledge of this community and our reading about the topic in the news and various journals that we uh, read now the superintendent informed by the board discussion by robust public input and by the consultants expertise is offering her recommendation to this board for criteria so with that dr. Heron I'd like to hand it over to you Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, following uh, the detailed discussion by the Board of Criteria at the last meeting, um, I'm bringing forward for your consideration the criteria of utilization, proximity, socioeconomic economic status, neighborhood concept, and longevity as defined in the agenda item for your consideration this evening. Thank you. And now, uh, can I have a motion so if we can discuss it? Madam Chair, I move that we accept this criteria as presented. We adopt the, the, under the topic, we adopt middle school criteria to include. You see that? Yes. I move that we um, adopt middle school criteria to include utilization, proximity, socioeconomic status, neighborhood concept, and longevity as defined below as criteria for development of draft middle school redistricting maps. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I have a second, please? Second. Uh, discussion. I ag I agree that it's important to look at this criteria and and not to necessarily rank order it. That it that we're looking at all pieces, um, it's a larger piece of puzzle, and that they they all need to be considered in the production of attendance zones. Not one criteria can be looked at in isolation. And, and just as a reminder, we are redistricting middle school because we're building a new middle school and therefore need to do that to accommodate the opening. Anything else? It's been moved and seconded. You want to call the roll, please, Ms. Serza? Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The motion passes. And just as a reminder, uh, there will be three maps uh, for the middle school, uh, three op options for us moving forward that will be provided as a result of this uh, criteria we just adopted. 
So that brings us to item 8.02, a high school redistricting criteria. Um, may I have a motion, please? Do you want me to do that? I move that we adopt the high school redistricting criteria of utilization, proximity, socioeconomic status, neighborhood concept, and longevity as defined below as criteria for the development of draft high school redistricting maps. I have a second, please. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? I'll go. Okay. Um, I, uh, I have no, no necessarily an issue with the, with the redistricting criteria. I think it should be the same as the middle school. <coughs> and I don't disagree with this redistricting criteria. What I do disagree with, um, I, think we, I think to this point we have proven that we need additional capacity um, and that we need, to, we need to work with our funding provider, providers to provide that additional capacity. Um, and I think that us continuing along with the high school redistricting and, and to the point of drawing maps is uh, too much of a distraction for this community and that uh, we should really, I think we should, we should end this and not continue on with drawing maps and, uh, and seeing where those boundaries lay. I think that creates too much um, churn. Uh, we have high school kids out there who I don't mind them watching school board meetings, but they're watching school board meetings instead of studying, and uh, they're very concerned about high school redistricting, and I just don't think if we are going to provide additional capacity in the next few years, redistricting now and redistricting then, is uh, too much disruption and really kind of violates one of our tenets of our criteria of longevity that I think, I think we should stop. So therefore, um, I'm not going to vote no tonight to this criteria, but I will abstain from the vote because I think we should stop now. Anybody else? I, I agree with uh, Mr. Kelly. Um, to, to me, it's pointless. I mean, I understand the concept of using that um, to support uh, the need for additional capacity, but I don't support going forth and drawing maps. So I, too, will be abstaining. Anybody else? I just, um, I think that we don't have any, um, well, I respect that and uh, I certainly understand it and, and believe that there's logic in it. I don't, we don't have any concrete new information in front of us today that than we had when we started. Um, we don't have um, anything in a CIP indicating to us that we will get new space. Um, whether that space is temporary or permanent. Um, we don't know if and when that space will come. So without any new information and nothing um, concrete, I don't think we have, um, I, think the most, I think the most prudent thing to do is to move forward and to better understand what kind of longevity might come with new maps. Um, our choices right now are redistricting, to ease capacity across three uh, high schools, uh, put in trailers, and, and build additions to the existing high schools, and the latter two cost money that we, that doesn't exist on paper. And because it doesn't exist on paper, I think um, we have to move forward, and um, conditions on the ground haven't changed that, we're, that we are aware of yet. Um, they may change in our CIP discussion, they may change um, as we get a, a more solid understanding of enrollment um, moving forward. But right now, with the information I have in front of me, I, I feel like our only option is to move forward with, with this criteria. Um, but I also want to be clear that the board has not decided to um, redistrict high school and may not decide to redistrict high school. I just don't think we have enough information to make that decision yet. And I also want to be clear that uh, if we move forward with tonight's motion, uh, we will be considering four maps, one of which will be the current. So I think that's just important for the community to understand. Can I respond? Let, let, let you. I agree. I agree with what um, Madam Chair is saying. I also think that um, our community is more resilient than we are giving them credit for in uh, saying that when we are creating maps, we're creating different scenarios, uh, we have to trust that uh, 
we teach all of our children, all of our high school seniors and juniors, rising seniors and juniors, that um, you know life is is going to throw you some curveballs sometimes. So one of the curveballs life might throw you is that there may possibly be different scenarios that you're going to be facing in your life. And they might not come, they might not happen, but they may. And just be used to the ambiguity of life. And so I think that we all, all of us, um, have to teach our our children to be a little resilient and um, to understand that we are facing some major budgetary issues. One of them is we're facing tonight with bus drivers and not paying them enough. I mean, that is a, uh, we're not paying our teachers enough. Uh, we have, and then at the same time, we're faced with trying to pay for trailers or pay for new schools. and. So I, I just think that we have to be fiscally responsible to our taxpayers. Mr. Kelly? The only problem I have with your with uh, what you've said there, Madam Chair, is uh, we go from one high school that's over capacity to basically all three that will be over capacity. Um, and then we will not have anything firm and, and on paper until April, which is well after we have to be through a redistricting process. So um, we won't be, have any funding or any CIP from from our funding partners until much later. So um, I think that this just creates churn, keeps it going for another few months that uh, is unnecessary to do to our high school students. And uh, the longevity that's one of our criteria just isn't there as we redistrict, as we consider redistricting high schools. So I, ju I just uh, um, kind of argue that logic a little bit. You've been a... Um articulate advocate of, of really being cautious about high school from, from the beginning, and I, and I respect that. I just um, think this is part of our due diligence work, and while I um, agree with you that um, that capacity is going to be an issue at all high schools, I, from my perspective, I don't have enough information to make a data informed decision on this topic. Madam Chair, and I would just like to echo um, this. This is a, a difficult topic that we're grappling with, but I think out of respect for our funding partners, we need to continue with this exercise and we need to collect more data. Um, the community has asked for transparency, and I think this is part of the process. Um, we are working in concert with our funding partners. Process. Mrs. Young? Okay, well, and I, I do agree that uh, high school students, or I, I believe all students can develop uh, resiliency, but I'm very concerned about the difficulty <coughs> we're already having with buses. Um, and for me, the, the, one of the biggest things is unless programs are equal across the high schools, um, I, I don't know what we're truly trying to accomplish. Um, if we're just going to use it for due diligence to, to demonstrate that there is a need for a greater capacity at the high school level, then I'm not against that, but I am against drawing maps that we may end up voting on. So I would like to stop it at this point. Anything else? Rosa, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers? No. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Abstain. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Abstain. Ms. Cook? Aye. Rise. So the motion passes. Brings us to item 8.03, appointments to the 21st Century and Career Ready Advisory Committee. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we appoint following individuals to the 21st Century and Career Advisory, Career Ready Advisory Committee. Richard Adal, John Achenbaugh, <coughs> Robin Cornell, Will Katz, and Jordan Lee. Second, please. Second. Any discussion? Moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. 
Ms. Cook? Aye. Bring us to um, 8.04, appointments to Special Education Advisory Committee. May I have a motion, please? Yes, Madam Chair, I move that we appoint the following <coughs> citizens to the Special Education Advisory Committee for term ending October 31st, 2019. Christina Jones, Christy Wagner, Christopher Waskey, Julia Ward, Hallie West, and Brittany Wilson. Second, please. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Sirza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Motion passes. Item 8.05, appointments to the Student Advisory Committee. May I have a motion, please? Yes, Madam Chair. I um, that we approve the following appointments to the Student Advisory Committee for the terms ending June 30, 2019. Liam Hurley, a freshman at Jamestown High School. Deja Bailey, Bailey, a freshman at Lafayette High School. And Lindsay Beck, a freshman at Warhill High School. Thank you. Can I have a second, please? Second. Any discussion? I'm moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ongby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The motion passes. Before we move on to um, the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan, I'd just like to say I'm delighted that Juan Spence has agreed to stay on the committee. That's wonderful. And I also want to thank everybody who put their name forward uh, to serve on these committees. And um, we appreciate it very much. It helps us do our work better. <clears throat> so that brings us to item 9.01, the fiscal year 2019 to 2028, uh, superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for school board established budget timeline, this evening we, uh, Ms. Berta, our chief financial officer on her last day with WJCC, will present uh, the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Barda. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Um, as you will recall, the last uh, meeting we presented the super of uh, the CIP committee recommendation. This presentation is slightly different than that, based on evaluation we've done internally. So I will share with you what is included in the superintendent's proposed capital improvement plan. As a reminder, we will focus on 2019, which is the next immediate funded year. We will review the modifications, additions, or deletions to the fiscal year 19 superintendent's proposed recommendation as it compares to the 2018 adopted five-year plan. All projects do include anticipated A&E design cost, contingency, and escalation annually. A new project may appear in the CIP for the first time due to new or updated information being received. The first project is the Matthew Whaley uh, chiller and hot water heater. This project did come in significantly above what we anticipated in last year's plan due to updated and revised quotes. The operations team has been back and forth many, many, many times um, with vendors to ensure that this cost estimate is accurate. The cost estimate did come down slightly from the last presentation to 321.301, which is still an increased cost over the original estimate by $184,455. The Matthew Whaley parking lot expansion, you will notice in our last presentation, was a higher dollar figure. This has been adjusted back to what it was in the fiscal year 18 plan. The front parking lot of Matthew Whaley will be addressed through division parking lot money that is already in play in the plan. Berkeley Middle School auditorium seating is the same as in the last year's plan of 167,633. The HVAC replacement construction phase at Laurel Lane is the same at $4,005,000. The Berkeley entrance redesign is the same at 110,176. The partial roof replacement at Berkeley is the same at 296,700. The Lafayette roof replacement, as we discussed the last time, has increased by 80767 from last year's plan due to the movement out one year by the county in order to seek bond funds to fund that project. Lafayette's electrical switch gear is 
a new estimate of 147,800, which is a decrease from our anticipated estimate last year by $77,977. And then Lafayette's replacement electrical panels has been re revised back to the original estimate of 152,505 based on an investigation that occurred in operations um, to determine what the scope of that project truly was. So there's no change from last year's cost estimate for that project. The Lafayette entrance redesign is the same at 110-177. The Lafayette exterior sewer line repair replacement is the same at 180,000. That is a new project for this year um, based on evidence that we received that we need to take care of that issue at Lafayette. The Jamestown HVAC replacement construction is the same at $5,580,000. The addition of five buses for $545,000 to support the opening of James Blair Middle. Parking lot funds at $320,000 and playground equipment at $90,000. Both were in the original plan. And a new one, which I will go into a little bit more detail on the next few slides, um, is new in the superintendent's proposed plan of high school expansion specific to Jamestown for design in fiscal year 19 of $901,822. What has changed? Um, based on some analysis that we've done on enrollment projections based on a draft report from uh, FutureThink, um, we've made some modifications to what we see coming for high school expansions. With that being said, we have removed the Jamestown High School caf High Cafeteria and Core Space expansion um, from fiscal year 19 because that's incorporated into the new um, design and construction in 19 and 20 respectively for Jamestown. We've also added high school capacity expansion and design and construction for Warhill in 2020 and 2021 and then in Lafayette in 21 and 22. The innovation space request for 300000 in fiscal year 19 and 20 has been reduced because we can incorporate that into our new design um, and construction philosophies for the high schools. One thing I want to say is these numbers can change. This is based on the 10-day counts, and it is based on a draft report that we've gotten from FutureThink. You will receive the final enrollment report in November. Um, Looking at high schools collectively, our capacity is 3,963 students. As of the 10-day count, we were at 3,838 students, meaning we had 125 available seats collectively by high school. If you look at the projection for next year, we are expecting enrollment of 3,927 students, which leaves 36 seats collectively. Moving to 19, we are at full capacity, meaning no seats. 2020, a slight dip in enrollment allows for 17 seats collectively. 2021, you go to 4,081 students, which means we're over capacity collectively by 118 seats. 2022, 166 seats. 2023, 201 seats. 2024, 250 seats. 2025, 331 seats. 2026, 345 seats, and then 2027, 394 seats. So you can see, based on current enrollment projections, there is no sign of high school enrollment slowing over the 10 years. With that being said, uh, the superintendent's recommendation is to do a tiered approach to our high school expansions. In fiscal year 19, Jamestown's design would be for 12 classroom spaces of $901,822. The construction would then be occurring in 2020. That is FF&E as furnitures, fixtures, and equipment um, to make sure that we can accommodate those additional 12 spaces. $10,449,860. Concurrently with that, we would begin to design the Warhill uh, expansion for eight classrooms. In 2021, the construction FF&E at Warhill for 4,561,597. Concurrently with that, the design of Lafayette, eight additional classroom spaces or the modification of the current 900 building is really what that is. Um, and then 2022, we would have construction at Lafayette for 5,944,16. 
How many classrooms did you say at Jamestown? It's 12. 12, okay. It's 12 at Jamestown, 8 at Warhill, and 8 at Lafayette. Madam Chair, if I, if I may, um, eight classrooms will accommodate roughly about 200 students, and um, the additional four classrooms, the thought behind that is that we would relocate the Learning Lab and GED programs to Jamestown High School in the additional four classrooms at Jamestown High School. And that would allow the student enrollment to increase at Lafayette, Lafayette High School. The programs would already be moved and Lafayette then could fill up to 100%. <clears throat> so taking a look at the five-year superintendent's proposed CIP, in fiscal year 19, the recommended projects would total 16020930 2020, 13,495,12. 2021, 11,969,792. 2022, 10,308,126. And 2023, 7,664,557. Making the five year request 59,453,917. Upcoming meetings on November the 14th, there would be a public hearing on the superintendent's proposed CIP. And then on December the 12th, and this, the CIP is slated to be adopted by the school board so we can pass that along to the Planning Commission at James City County and the city. Happy to entertain any questions. Before I um, turn to my colleagues for questions, can you um, describe, can yes. you explain these two documents, please? Yes. Thank you. In front of you, you have a spreadsheet document that summarizes it by school. Um, the green is specifically related. At the top, you'll see it highlighted in green. It's specifically re related to what is in the five-year plan. The yellow is planning year, six through ten, because you are only uh, required to adopt a five-year plan. That's what the city and county do. Um, the larger document is a detailed version that shows you the details by project as well as by school and then gives you descriptors about increases or decreases and changes from the last year plan. Just in finishing, Madam Chair, if I could ask Ms. Berta to go back to the numbers, the enrollment numbers again, just to make one more comment there. If you notice out 10 years, the total uh, added number of students is just under 400. Um, what is being proposed this evening is a 10-year plan. It's not an incredibly long-term solution, but it's an economically um, good plan to last for 10 years based on current enrollment, but understanding that these numbers do change when we get them every year. But we've seen steady increase in the high school, in fact, a larger increase at, the high, at Warhill High School this year, um, 70 students more than we expected. And so that's why we made the decision to push up the additions to the high schools because we will need them in two years. In fact, we need them now. And I just want to remind everybody, so we do have a public hearing, as Ms. Berta said, on the 14th of November. We have two meetings in November during which uh, we will discuss this robustly so that we are comfortable adopting in December. And so um, tonight, this is the first time we're seeing it, so please feel free to come with questions uh, at, in the November meeting. Um, but in the, in the meantime, anyone have any comments or questions at this time? So just to be clear about the, the modifications at Lafayette, that's we would take all of the 900 building and convert that into classroom space. That's correct. So CDR also would leave that space. That's also correct. So there'd be no programs in that building except for Lafayette student classrooms. Regular right. classrooms. Yes, ma'am. Anything else at this time? You know. Um, I, I think probably these are questions are more for Marcellus than Christina. So the, the entry redesigns at Berkeley and Lafayette are for the safety improvements? Correct. They're for the safety improvements. Got you. The um, switch gear and electrical parts? The electrical switch gear was a faithful and goal, and the um, electrical panels were a faithful and goal recommendation. We had those uh, verified this year. One was through MJT. Um, they were verified that we the cost of those. 
And those are, and, uh, those are really, at the end of the day, safety improvements as well. Yes, the uh, electrical panels are, are original to the building. They're the old Westinghouse, and so we are replacing all of those. Um, yeah, the sewer line repairs were the, the issue that we're having with uh, uh, drainage. Yeah, the, it's, the, it's the external uh, repairs that we're doing. Internally, there's no way to determine where there could be an issue and if there is an issue. Okay. Um, back to the... Uh, uh, forecasted enrollments. So future thing, did we, re we get them to revisit their projections every year, correct? We do. <clears throat> and um, it, it'll be interesting to see how they react to the growth at Warhill and um, as the construction on 64 completes, if these numbers uh, go up a little bit, that they're anticipating more growth in the northern end of the county. And there's, they've, always, they've always said there was going to be some in the center of the county, but it'll be interesting to see how they come to the to the northern end of the county. So I, don't, I think that'll just be uh, interesting to see that. So um, those, are, those are really all the questions I have, Madam Chair. I just, I just think that uh, uh, Mrs. Bird is going to need to improve this and bring this back to the next meeting. I think that's a requirement. I think so. I think so. Just want to make sure. We can email questions to you, right? I'm always <laughs> accessible. <laughs> Just not responsive necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else before we move on to board member comments? Thank you very thank much, Ms. Berta. And thank you, Dr. Heron. All right, that brings us to item 10.01 board member comments. Um, okay, first of all, I wanted, they're not here, that this is uh, the week we're supposed to recognize our best drivers. I wanted to let them know that um, I totally support them. I. Um, having had little kids on buses, I, I don't envy their job. So I'm uh, grateful for them and appreciate that they're, all their hard work. Uh, I had the opportunity of visit, visiting operations with uh, Mr. Snipes uh, last week, and as usual, it was enjoyable. I enjoyed our conversation very much and enjoyed my favorite part of that is the, the um, the bus bay where they're repairing the vehicles, and again, it was very well maintained, and I'm always impressed with operations. Um, Ms. Berta, we're going to miss you. So, um, but good luck in your new job, because uh, I won't say you'll need it. I think they're going to be, they're, they're the ones who are getting the uh, huge benefit. So thank you for all of your service. Um, and, and last, I did have the opportunity of uh, visiting the WJCC Schools Foundation last night. I want to thank uh, those teachers. Uh, Ms. Huntley, I enjoyed your presentation very much last night, and I would have loved to have been a little kid with a lab coat uh, because I thought that was just uh, wonderful. I didn't get there in time to play with the robots and do the virtual reality. So, uh, But I really want to thank um, uh, the teachers and encourage them to apply. Um, for, for that opportunity. I also had the opportunity with Ms. Hummel to, to uh, meet with uh, citizens on, at the village and uh, um, am looking forward to see what they can accomplish in, in their tutoring program. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Before I go to the next school board member, I, um, Dr. Heron, uh, because of the uh, public comment we had tonight, I'd like to ask you two quick questions. Uh, the first, can you just remind us about the analysis that you're working on with regard to non-instructional staff? Can you talk about that? Yes, Madam Chair, as, you, as the board are aware, we just had our uh, end-of-year funding plan approved by the, both the county and the city. And because of that, we've actually, in the process of organizing a salary analysis, which will cover administrative positions and support positions. And one of the positions we will, of course, be looking at is that of bus drivers and looking at, at their compensation. Thank you. And the second question I have is, um, would it be possible um, at some point in the not-too-distant future to just take a look at that once a month pay? Um, yeah. uh, and, um, if we could, if, if you could just take a look and, and, and think about that, uh, we appreciate just a second look at that. We, we can certainly take a look at it. Thank you. Zombie. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to um, 
make the community aware that um, the division will be hosting band night on October 30th, which is a wonderful opportunity for the community to come and listen to our middle school as well as our high school bands. And this year, our high schoolers will be showing off their new um, band uniforms. So very exciting night um, to listen to our bands and, um, and get to hear what they have to do and watch our middle schoolers um, perform with the high schoolers. I too attended the Education Foundation event last night and am always awed by our teachers. They are very creative and I'm very grateful that we have the Education Foundation to allow our teachers to um, do some really neat um, learning initiatives with their students. Um, had an opportunity to tour um, JBB with um, Ms. Cook and I'll let you speak to that but I just wanted to share too I always learn ever, something new when I go to each of our schools and and one of the things that's really cool to me recently is that so many of our elementary school classrooms are allowing students flexible seating and so we got to see that in action um, at JBB the entire third grade has that option and I think that's such a huge impact for our students to be able to 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 sit and learn in ways that, that best suit them and, and meet their individual needs um, kudos again to Stonehouse. Um, also kudos to our community partners like the Village. Um, it's with our partners uh, like the Village who coordinate tutoring opportunities that we can meet the needs of all of our students. And so this really, it does take a Village um, to raise our, our students and to, and to educate each of them to their ability. And so I thank um, organizations like the Village and other community volunteers who work <coughs> in all of our schools. Um, and I too wanted to say goodbye to Ms. Berta. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I'm trying to figure out how I get in front of Mrs. Ownby. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the bus drivers. Uh, they are, um, I, I can't disagree with anything that was said tonight. They're the first, first employee of our school system that many, many of our children see, as well as the last one. Um, they have a significant impact upon the educational experience of our children. Um, there is, uh, their value is, un, is unbelievable. Um, it's it's once again another symptom of the disease of the lack of funding for our public schools uh, it's the uh, it's right now it's the bus drivers in some places of the states it's uh, teachers um, how how much longer before it's cafeteria workers and janit janitorial staff I mean we when we do pay raises we you know we get and we give our paltry one percent one and a half percent to our teachers and we do that to support staff but uh, 1% of, of one number is a lot different than 1% of another number. Um, and so the, the one speaker who talked about a living wage is absolutely spot on. I, I understand completely. Um, <coughs> it's, uh, it's, a, a, it's really a crisis that we have in this country on the, on the funding of our public schools, and it is, it is coming to a head, and uh, I fear when that will come to a head uh, and how soon that will be. Uh, the, uh, going through the CIP numbers today and and looking at our capital plan and the and the uh, the enrollment projections of our high school uh, tells us the need that we need additional capacity um, and we need this additional capacity a couple of years ago uh, not a couple of years from now uh, the, the our our community um, grows continues to grow will continue to grow as as uh, the uh, constructions complete on 64. Um, and it grows because of our school system and because of the great teachers that we have here. And uh, we need to, and, and it's, not, it's not just James City County, it's the Commonwealth of Virginia that has a problem. And we need to look at, look at, uh, at that from a much more global perspective. So, um, and, and I'd also like to, to bid adieu to Mrs. Berta. Um, we've uh, gone through a lot together. Uh, you have always uh, served this community and served this school system well, and uh, we appreciate the work that you've done, and uh, know you will represent us well in your new job as saying that you're from Williamsburg, James City County. So congratulations to you, and we will miss you. Dr. Kelly, Dr. Beers? Yeah, first of all, um, accolades have to go out again. I seem to say this almost... Uh, every meeting <clears throat> but uh, it's it's always uh, there are always different schools um, the Wells Fargo Award to Jamestown High School um, Matoka National PTA School of Excellence Stonehouse becoming uh, the um, second Blue Ribbon School I'd like to see uh, some more schools um, it is a rigorous process but um, I think it's well worth um, applying for that 
Um, and uh, also, um, I, I echo everything that's been said in support of our support staff, and that certainly includes our um, bus drivers, and I hope there is a way that um, we can, we can if, if we can't rectify, at least try to um, make some inroads into um, more significant compensation. And then last but not least, um, Miss Berta. <laughs> um, I am really sorry to see you go. Um, I have very much appreciated um, your um, rapid response <laughs> team. <laughs> Whenever there have been questions um, having anything to do with money and um, finances and um, going to a, uh, an outstanding school system as well, but we will miss you. Uh, you still may get a call once in a while. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Beers. Ms. <clears throat> um I wanted to uh, just say how much I enjoyed watching Stonehouse's video. Um, I, too... <laughs> had that same feeling that Mr. Kelly did walking into Stonehouse and seeing all of the painted murals on the wall. It automatically just makes you happy to be there. And it's amazing when you have the, the right faculty and staff and support people to, to make all that magic happen for our children. So I just wanted to say it was wonderful to watch that and, and to know that those little magical moments are happening at all of our all of our schools in WJCC. Uh, and so I also want to say thank you for all the unsung heroes that are out there working and doing their best every day. Um, whether they get a blue ribbon or not, I, I really appreciate all of the time that they spend working with our children. Um, I too have my heart, uh, a special place in my heart for Miss Barbara Klein, who was our uh, bus driver for years and years, and she she made my children very, very safe and happy and welcomed. And so, I don't know if any of you've watched that video that have been that's been going around on social media. It's the video that talks about uh, what happens to children when there are happy people welcoming them to school versus unhappy people welcoming them to school and what kind of children they turn into, what kind of adults they turn into based on those first impressions that they get and the very, very first impression that they have as their bus driver. So um, I, I too support anything that we can do to make the lives of our bus drivers um, financially better and I I know that we um, saved money uh, with our <coughs> computer system by going to one month payments, which is fine for people that are making maybe a certain amount of money, but when you are living paycheck to paycheck, then I think getting those paychecks twice a month, if it is at all possible for us to look into that, I think it's something we should seriously consider doing. Um, I also want to uh, say I enjoyed going to my meeting with the village, and I didn't. It, when Miss Young and I were meeting with them, we didn't know what the results were going to be with all of the tutors. So it was just delightful to hear the report tonight that they were able to get 35 tutors from William and Mary to actually help uh, the, the students that are in most need. And then finally, goodbye, Miss Berta. We will miss you. <laughs> All of my questions and that are kind of stupid questions that you have answered over over the years. I thank you and good luck in Chester. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Okay, everyone up here is always so eloquent, so I feel like there's never anything left. Maybe we'll have to switch it up sometime. But um, congratulations again to Stonehouse. Love the video. It's great to see all the good work going on in our classrooms. Um, and thank you to everyone who came out to speak tonight, especially about the transportation issues. Um, very important to us. Um, and we'll miss you, Ms. Berta. So for my first budget as a school board member, I sat down with Ms. Berta, and I think I had 45 questions. <laughs> and you did not roll your eyes once. You were very helpful, so thank you. Congratulations. We'll miss you. Please come back and visit. Uh, I'm certain that we will be in touch. So, um, I also just wanted to echo what Zombie said then. Um, 
uh, we, uh, Council Member Scott Foster joined us on our tour. Um, it was really great for him to take some time out of his day and he was so impressed that he actually asked um, if uh, Ms. Stam would uh, give his mother a tour of the school. She's a kindergarten teacher in the western part of the state. So <laughs> he's actually shipping her in for a day to tour one of our schools. So I thought that was pretty. Pretty amazing, and I wanted to again congratulate Stonehouse uh, on its uh, blue ribbon award. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you to the village for um, believing in the kids in our schools and, and, and um, arranging for tutors to go in. I can't wait to see how that unfolds and that how that how that uh, works out. Um, and then I just did want to comment and, and thank all the dry, uh, bus drivers uh, who came out and all the people who supported them. Um, it's critical that people come to these meetings, tell us what they're thinking, um, and I, I, I encourage it. Uh, it helps us do our job. Um, it helps with transparency about what's going on in the division and what's important to people. So please continue to come um, and, and share with us your thoughts, thoughts because we all really um, listen and care and want to know. And I just, it's a very difficult situation. It's not just our bus drivers, as Mr. Kelly said. It's, it's our custodial staff and our, um, and, uh, and our, uh, the people who work in our cafeterias. We are a service, uh, service sector community. Our wages are low and our housing prices are high. Uh, the last report I read that was put out by the Virginia State uh, Department of Social Services suggested that in James City County you have to work three full-time jobs at minimum wage to afford a two-bedroom apartment. So um, there are a lot of people uh, who work for our division who are under tremendous financial stress. And I think about that every day. And so I hope there's something that we can do to ease some of that burden uh, in our upcoming budget. But Mr. Kelly, you're right. It has to do with education funding. So anyway, with that, uh, is there anything else before we... So 11.01 uh, upcoming events on the 18th of October the policy committee meets at 4 o'clock in the annex and at uh, central office and on November 8th the school liaison committee will meet at 4 o'clock here in the striker center and the school uh, this uh, special education advisory committee will meet on November 9th at 630 in the James City County Recreation Center. Is there anything else, any other upcoming events that I neglected? Okay. And then our upcoming school board meetings. Um, our next meeting is on the 14th of November. It's a closed session at 6 o'clock. Do we have one on the 1st? Uh, the 7th day. is election day. We always meet the... Check. Day, we're watching the returns. I thought we had a meeting on the 1st. So, yeah, so it's the 11th, uh, I mean the 14th of November at 6 p.m. in uh, the annex uh, in room 309 at, the, at James Blair Central Office, um, followed by a public hearing on the capital improvement plan, uh, also on the 14th of November in room 300 of the school board central office in the annex, and followed again by a work session and action items also on the 14th immediately after that public hearing in room 300 of the annex. On the 28th of November, we will have a closed session here in the City Council Work Session Room at the Stryker Center, followed by a regular meeting at 6.30, also on the 28th here in City Council Chambers. Unless there's anything else, this meeting's adjourned.